Folks, you know you're in for a treat when you hear that tune because it's time for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. I've got the best freaking job in the world. I get to hang out here on Monday nights and talk poker with my friends. Uh, that's what we do here at Rec Poker. We're a friendly group. We're a, a, an enthusiastic, fun-loving group of recreational amateur poker players. And uh, uh, we we talk about poker. We learn together. We study together. We play together. We celebrate together. We commiserate together. Um, it's just a great group of folks that love poker as much as you do, maybe even more. If you're unsure, come sign up for a free Rec Poker account. All it takes is an email address and a smile. And you'll unlock the forums, the home games, the Discord channel, the YouTube channel, uh, the access to the podcast, all sorts of great stuff that comes free. Um, or you can take your game to the next level by dropping $5 by using the code RECPOKER and trying out our premium membership uh, for only 5 bucks. After that, it's only $15 a month. That's one $5 a month. And uh, that really helps us out a lot. So uh, if you don't know what we're all about here, like I say, I'm Jim Reed. I'm Bluff Torini in the home game and at Rec Poker Jim on Twitter. I think I already mentioned I have the best job in the world. I have to thank the Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and uh, Casino for that because they've been our sponsor for a long time. But there's a lot of people to thank because I also have to thank our premium members and, of course, the Wrecking Crew. If you don't know about the Wrecking Crew, it's not just me. It is this whole group of people, a village, a crew that get together every day, every week, every month to make Wreck Poker great. And if you want to find out more about me and the rest of the Wrecking Crew, you can go to wreck.poker slash crew. But just listen up. You're going to meet one of them, one of the OGs of the Wreck Poker Wrecking Crew right here. Yeah, my name is Rob Washam, and I'm Rabman50 just about everywhere. And uh, Rob and I are uh, rocking the forums booth tonight. We're going to be talking about a forum post from Eric Anderson. Uh, regular listeners will recognize Eric's name. He's been a poster in our forums for a long time and occasionally joins us here on the podcast. Uh, this is a, a post about final table ICM. And the question is simply, what is my risk premium given the uh, details of his final table situation? So there, there is an answer to what his risk premium is. And we're going to kind of get there the long way by talking, by using this opportunity to talk a little bit about the concept of risk premium, how it relates to ICM, and kind of why that's important to tournament poker players. So, Rob, this is a subject that's come up a, uh, many times. You run our book study religiously. You're a fantastic facilitator of that. And the sort of the concept of risk premium, bottable factor, the application of ICM pressure, this is something that has come up a lot in the in the books that you've been working with. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about risk premium and sort of why it's important and, and how we can calculate it? Sure, sure. First of all, I want to, my glib answer to Eric's original question, because it had to do with the home game. He was five-handed in final table of the home game. He asked what his Rick's premium was. And it's, I said, it must be a trick question because this is a winner take all tournament. I mean, you do get X amount of free poker stars chips to play your next free home game. I mean, that is a consideration, but in a winner take all tournament, because really the prize is that bronze pin. Mm, those are good looking so, pins. Good looking kids. <laughs> so it's a winner take all tournament is for all intents and purposes. And I think most players are playing it that way and not looking at ICM as a factor as they get into the final table. So I made kind of a glib answer there. And uh, Eric came back and said, well, um, home games is one of the only occasions where I play attorney with one prize. So, but so as practice, he wants to think in terms of a normal payout structure, which is great. Just understand that no one else at the table is doing that. So when you are making your evaluation as to how you respond to what they're doing, you need to understand that they're not taking ICM into consideration. So he was looking at what his what is his normal risk factor based on his chip position and risk risk premium or bubble factor are pretty much the same thing. And what that 
means is that to call an all in, you need more equity in a money EV situation than you do in a chip EV situation. So in a chip EV, if you're 51%, boom, jam it all in, let's go. But you need more um, equity in a dollar EV stand or in, in terms of dollar EV. So what I did is I ran a, a, a deal for him and I looked at how do you compute bubble factor? Hmm. It's not just one thing that you use against every opponent at the table. Your bubble factor changes based on the number of chips each opponent has. And your bubble factor only comes into play when you're calling an all in. That's when the bubble factor or risk premium comes into play. It's how much equity do you need to call an all in? So the two things you need to know is um, how much equity you gain or lose, or I'm sorry, how much EV you gain or lose, how much value you gain or lose based on whether you win or lose. And then you also need to understand what their range of hands is they're going all in with. So to figure out your bubble factor, in this particular case, he was five-handed and the first player, um, against the first player, if he had gone, gone all in, he had a bubble factor of 1.32. So 1.32 divided by 1.32 plus one is how you compute the equity required for that bubble factor which was 56%. So against the first player, if he, the first player had gone all in, he would need a hand with 56% equity against the range that he expected that player to go all in with. So that's how bubble factor is worked or risk premium works. So it's, it's like an extra amount of equity that you have to have versus that range to make up for the, the times that you lose the tournament and you kind of lose all your equity in the tournament. Is that roughly correct? correct. Or you lose some equity. I mean, if you have that player covered, Oh, good point. Um, you're going to, you're not going to necessarily miss out. You're still going to have some equity, no matter what, you're going to have equity once you're in the money, because you're going to get whatever is that last prize is. The thing is about that whole, that, that whole um, ec equation that people don't really understand is you always lose more than you gain. So when you get into a calling and all in, whether you have them covered or not, you always are risking more than you are gaining. Because remember, the fewer chips you have, the more each chip is worth. Hmm. So as you gain chips, you're not gaining as much um, dollar EV as you are chip EV. So chips are not worth as the more chips you have, the less each one of them is worth. So you're all you're always risking more money EV than you are gaining in any all in confrontation in an ICM situation. So the bubble factor or the risk premium is what you need to take into effect based on that equation of how much you're risking versus how much you gained you can gain by winning and we're just getting a couple uh, premium members popping into the show here which is fantastic we love it when some of our premium members come and join the conversation uh, tim and dj welcome to the show we're just talking to rob washam about the concept of uh, risk premium and how it relates specifically to uh well to final table situations but really to any icm uh, related situation. So this is a little bit tournament focused. Um, and we're, uh, if anyone has any questions for Rob, please feel free to type them into the chat or to just turn your uh, mic on and answer. But otherwise, um, I'm just going to keep talking to Rob about this little concept a little and, um, and then we will be recording another episode next. So I hope uh, you guys stick around and we can talk a little further. So obviously, Rob, as I'm saying, this is only for tournaments because ICM only matters in tournaments. And can you have a risk premium or a bubble factor even when you're not at the final table and you're earlier in the tournament and it's just ICM is kind of less of a factor, but it's still present? 
Yeah, I think I think that's very true. Um, I recently saw a video put out by GTO um, Wizard on one of their guy. I can't remember the guy's name. He puts out a lot of videos about it, and he's saying that there is actually ICM is a consideration from the beginning of the tournament throughout. Hmm. It's just not as strong a situation. Then there was another little video I saw recently on Twitter. Uh, Matt Hunt from Solve for Y was yep. talking about um, if you use a strictly chip EV um, uh, strategy throughout a tournament, you're going to win more tournaments. But, but. you're not going to cash as many tournaments. Your ROI is going to go down. You are going to win more, but you're not going to cash as often. So ICM has more of a factor when you're looking at that ROI number of how much money you're making per tournament type thing. So, um, yeah, it basically what it what it talks about is going for the win. So if you're doing chip EV, you're just going for the win. You don't care about any other payouts. You don't care about the bubble. Nothing matters. The only thing that matters is winning that tournament. And that's why a tournament like the rec poker home game, which has one prize, a winner take all. That's why ICM has no bearing on it. So there's two ways of looking at tournament play. If you are a tournament grinder, you're not looking for that one big payout. You're looking for a continual stream of income that you're going to get from grinding tournaments. And so if you're doing that, then ICM has to be a consideration for you as you play. I really like that way of thinking about it, Rob, because if you're playing a large volume of tournaments, like you said, what really matters is your ROI. You want to increase the, the, the amount that you're going to win on average in all these tournaments. And that might, that might require taking a more cautious or conservative approach near the bubble, near large pay jumps and stuff like that. Um, which is which is just it's it's different and and I I, I really like the way you said you know if you if you play chip EV you have you have a better chance of winning more tournaments but you're going to make less money uh, as a poker player because you're not being savvy about those pay jumps those laddering opportunities and bubbles mm -hmm. and that kind of thing yep um, yep and and I think people get stuck on this idea that you you know, well, I'm never going to be able to make those calculations at the table, like when I'm actually sitting there playing. Um, how how accurate do we have to be, Rob, when we're trying to calculate things like risk premium or bubble factors? Um, and, and how much of it can, can we even do at the table versus how much of it do we have to kind of practice in the lab uh, before it's game time? That's very difficult to do at the table. Um you can come close. I mean, you can get kind of an idea, but the best way of going about it, and this was based on Daro Carney's book, uh, End Game Poker Strategy, which we uh, did our book study on recently. And he talks about you need to do the work off the table. You need to run these calculations off the table. Look at some final tables that you play. And especially if you play a lot of online tournaments, you can get all of that information, hang on to it, and then after the fact, go back and look at what were the buggable factors? What were, what was the ICM pressure at different points and how does it, how would it affect it? How I did. Once you do that a number of times, you kind of get a good feel for, um, there's situations where the only thing you can call an all in with is aces or Kings. And that's, that's just what it is. There's other situations. If you're on a bubble where it might be, recommended that you fold aces because it's like being on the bubble is like being in a satellite. You don't, you don't get any extra money for having more chips when the bubble breaks, when the bubble breaks, you're going to get X amount of money in a satellite. When the bubble breaks, you're going to get that seat or that money, whatever it is. So you're not getting any extra for gaining chips just before the bubble. So if you have enough chips to survive the bubble, Rather than getting it all in against three or four players that have you covered with aces, just fold them because you can make the money and then worry about your aces later. And it's just like you were saying before, if what really mattered was your ability to win that tournament, 
then you'd probably risk getting your aces in three or four hands, you know, three or four ways because it would be a nice big triple up if you win. But because winning isn't necessarily as important as not losing, then you end up taking this more conservative approach like like you're talking about here. Right. And right. And so um, risk premium and bubble factors, these are really just ways that some of these pros have come up with quantifying the value of this pressure. Is that essentially right? Pretty much. Yeah. They're putting math to the problem, you know, and poker is a lot of math. You are, are playing a game of incomplete information. The only thing you know is what the math says and the math doesn't lie. So as long as you can understand what the math is and you can get a, get an idea of the kind of ranges that your opponents are playing, and you should be doing that anyway throughout the course of whether you're playing cash or tournaments or whatever, you should always be considering what range of hands your opponent is making those actions with. So as long as you get a feel for that, you can get an understanding of what equity you need to uh, play against that range. And that's I all think, math. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It, and it's, it's the unsexy part of poker, right? It's the stuff that you have exactly. to actually yeah. break, break out the books when you're not at the table. And, uh, but just like practicing ranges, you know, pre-flop ranges when you're not at the table, the, the goal is to just give yourself a better approximation of what the right answer is in real time at the mm -hmm. tables. No one's expecting you to have the details to the fourth decimal point, but just to get a sense of like avoiding big mistakes, right? Like, like that's, yep. if you take nothing else from this, um, I know a lot of our listeners are tournament players. A lot of our listeners are cash game players. Um, and I think there's a lot of benefit to kind of playing with both, but this is something that if you're a cash game player, you really need to study the effects of ICM if you're going to succeed in tournaments. Um, it's a crucial element. And it's also something that's very hard to study in isolation. Like it's hard to practice ICM other than putting yourself in uncomfortable positions and trying to uh, you know, make the best possible decision. Um, so Rob, what, like, how can we practice this or how can we prepare ourselves for when we're in that position and we want to be able to start thinking logically and 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 thoughtfully about about things like ICM the bubble factor um and uh the risk premium and that kind of thing how do you how do you prepare for that yeah, yeah like I say it's just study off the table um I know I I do a lot of uh small stakes tournaments like on ACR where I'll, I'll late register and they might only have 80 or 90 players in them. So you get to the, you get to an ICM spot really quickly in those. Mm. And I, then what I do is I, I take a screenshot after the registration is over of what is the payouts. And then I can keep that for later. And then along with my poker tracker, because I have all my hands that I've played, I can go back and look at what were those ICM factors that I was playing against and then compare that to the way I actually played the hand. You know, was, did the way I play it, was that, um, was that ICM savvy, in other words, or was it ICM suicide? Because that's what <laughs> most people are playing ICM suicide because they don't understand ICM, especially these small stake tournaments. But at least it gives you a feel for uh, what, how much those factors come into play. And the main thing that you're discovering is if you're playing against a bunch of people that are not ICM aware, it changes drastically the way you need to approach it. So if players are ICM aware, their ranges are probably going to be much tighter than someone who's not ICM aware. So when they're not ICM aware, your equity can will probably go down. It's equity you need to call will probably go down because that player is playing a wider range than he should be. Whereas if he's an ICM smart player, he's going to be playing a much tighter range in those situations, and it's going to cause your equity required to call to go way up. Yeah, and it's one of those weird situations where 
usually in a poker scenario, if you are a more studied uh, player than your opponents, if you understand the concepts better than your opponents, you have a very natural skill edge. And it's relatively easy to express that skill edge just by making better poker decisions than your opponents do. If your opponents don't know about ICM, it, their, their mistakes can actually end up costing you a lot as well. Um, because if you're making assumptions about your opponents thinking, oh, well, they, they're going to fold here a lot because I have them covered and, you know, they can't afford to lose here. And so I can shove really wide. They, they might not know enough about ICM to know that they're supposed to be folding a lot of hands there. And now all of a sudden they're calling with a wider range than you expect. You're actually having to get to showdown to win the hand. And it's, it, it feels like one of those areas where your opponent's lack of knowledge can actually hurt you as much as it hurts them. Is that, is that true? Like, is that, is that a oh, yeah. fair way of saying it? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. I think there's many times when any of us that have gone all in, in a situation and we're surprised to see what our opponent called us with, mm -hmm. because there is no way that you would have called an all in, in that same situation with that hand. So then you know they don't understand. Um, they might not even understand what equity means. You know mm -hmm. how much equity they need to call that type of situation. Um, they're playing. They're playing bingo. They're playing. You know they're they're gambling. They're just saying, "Well, I got an ace. Let's go." Yeah. You know, and and then you're stuck with you know them getting lucky. They made a big big mistake. They got lucky. You're out of the tournament, and they think they're geniuses. <laughs> Yeah. And that's okay. You want you want that because the next time you're up against them, they'll make that same mistake, but it won't work out so well for them. Yeah. And and I want to, you know, I want to reinforce the point that, you know, when people make ICM mistakes, they're definitely hurting themselves. But they're but it's the kind of mistake that they can hurt you at the same time. They can kind of take you down with them. So I always do try and get a sense when you get to a final table or or near a pay jump. I mean, you really want to kind of look around the table a bit and see who is also paying attention to this element of the game. Who's has anyone, you know, what's the conversation at the table? Are, are people talking about strategy or ICM or the bubble? Um, because the people that are, you're going to be able to apply more pressure against them than the other players that, that uh, don't know any better. Um, so that's something that, you know, very, very much comes down to player dependent. Uh, exploits like that yeah that's not even not even they're talking about strategy talking about how much the payouts mean to them yes so does laddering mean a lot to this person or do they you know is it does it not matter um and they just they're just going for the win so there's a lot of a lot of situations where you can get that feeling from the players as you talk to them how important is this how important is winning versus just laddering up now, if it's very important for them to just ladder up because the money means something to them, then you can put a lot more pressure on them. If laddering up doesn't mean as much, you can't put as much pressure on them and they're mm -hmm. going to fight back because they want to win that tournament. So those are the types of things, like you said, you want to look for um, at a final table or when you get close to the money. What are people's feelings about the money? And so the, the last two points I want to leave uh, leave our audience with on the show before we close this out. The first is don't let the time that you're at the final table be the first time that you're thinking about this kind of stuff. OK, what the, you're, you're not going to make that many final tables. You're not going to be in. I mean, as recreational players, we just don't play enough tournaments to get into these spots often enough. So I guarantee you. You, now is the time to start doing some math, to start hitting the books, to be talking to folks like Rob over here at Rec Poker in the forums or in the book study, um, to start thinking about this kind of stuff, start identifying what are the big mistakes that I can at least avoid making myself when the time comes, because you, you are not going to want to be trying to learn this on the fly uh, while you're there at the final table. And the other point I would make is kind of the counter, the other side of the coin, you also have your own motivations for playing the tournament. Like laddering up might not be as important to you as the chance to win the tournament. And this is something that pros and recs alike are going to experience. Um, like 
uh, you know, if I'm playing in the in the in a World Series of Poker, you know, larger buy-in event than I would normally be playing in, I'm going to be very ICM aware because it matters to me a lot. If I'm like a ten thousand dollar tournament, um, I want to make the pay jumps. I want to make the bubble. Of course, I want to win, but like that money means something to me, and so I'm going to be more ICM aware. In uh, in a situation like it came up. Just last week, I was playing in the rec poker home game on a Tuesday night, and we were down to three-handed, and I was the middle stack in the big blind, and the player on the button uh, shoved, and they they had me covered. And I looked down, I had pocket fours, and I had a note on this player that they were shoving really wide, and in a typical ICM spot... I think it would probably be an uncontroversial fold because there was another short stack at the table. And, it, you know, it was just naturally in a, in a typical ICM structure, I'd be folding there just to try and express a better edge later on. But it was in this winner take all format. And I didn't care at all if I placed second or third. All I cared about was the chance to go and win this tournament. And I knew that if I doubled up here, I was going to be the chip leader by a lot. This other guy was going to be crippled. And there would basically just be one more player in the tournament that uh, that I had to play against. And so there was this, um, the anti-ICM, sort of the future game simulation element of it, of, of I don't really care if I bust here, but if it gives me a chance to win the tournament, a better chance to win the tournament, um, then, then that's worth doing. So I did make the call. And a lot of the time I'm crushed there. Like if he's got, he, he's shoving pocket fives plus for sure, which I'm dead in the water against. As it happened, I got lucky and he only had two overs. But if you think about the kind of spot I'm putting myself in there, the best case scenario is I'm flipping against two overs. And the worst case scenario is I'm absolutely decimated coming up against an over pair. So it was, you know, it wasn't like the right call but for what I wanted out of the tournament, it was it was it was a, a chance that I took, um, and I'd encourage you know maybe I won't tell people to go calling all in in spots like that with pocket fours, but do think about like what is my reason for playing the tournament, and do I care if I bust in this spot or am I trying to go get that that first uh, first position prize? Um, because we're recreational players too. It, like for us, the ROI is kind of a little less important than the experience of playing and winning and uh, you know what that what that could mean especially we're going to play a smaller set of tournaments so we're never really going to get to realize our our variance in the long run um rob anything to add before we uh, no nope, just uh, it sounds like you were in a typical chip ev situation versus a money ev situation which occurs in a winner takes all tournament so you played it exactly right uh thanks buddy well, um, I hope I hope our listeners have found something interesting uh, about this sort of this element of ICM pressure and risk premium and bubble factors. Um, Rob is elbows deep in this stuff every two weeks as part of the book study here at Rec Poker. Uh, so, folks, if you want to come and give that a try, I'd encourage it. You will learn something fun and you will become a better poker player. So uh, thanks to Rob Washam. And thanks to Eric Anderson for putting the post out there and starting this conversation. Thanks to the Running Aces Hotel, Race Trash, and Casino. And thanks to you, the listeners. We'll catch up with you again next week. Have a good night.